Hey, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to our session on making the case for embodied carbon. On behalf of the Boston Society for Architecture, thank you for joining this 11th session of Embodied Carbon 101, BSA's 12 part program taking place this summer. So every Monday this summer, the series has brought you embodied carbon programming with foundational knowledge, tools and takeaways. And we're wrapping up the series with a couple of sessions on how to get others on board with embodied carbon work. This week's session is making the case and next week's session process and firm culture. So I'm Nadav Malin, president of Building Green, a company dedicated to helping architects, designers, and other sustainability professionals make their work greener and healthier. And I'm really pleased to be joined today by Rachel White, CEO of Bigmeister, a residential design build firm working to preserve existing homes and adapt them to meet the needs of the 21st century by Kate Bubriski, Director of Sustainability and Building Performance at Arrow Street, a Boston-based architecture and design firm, by Matt Gifford, Principal at Shepley Bullfinch, a large firm working nationally in education, healthcare, and urban development, and an early signatory to Architecture 2030, and last but certainly not least, by Gunnar Hubbard, Principal and Sustainability Practice Leader at Thornton Tomasetti, an international engineering and consulting firm. So as you can see, we've got a great panel with a whole range of experiences, different scales and types of projects lined up to talk about this, this question of making the case from a lot of different perspectives. So let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. Um, we have Arc Woods and Services, Goody Clancy, Huber Engineered Woods, Kingspan, Nordic Structures, Select Building Products and Thought Forms. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. So thank, thank you to the sponsors for supporting this. And also there are some important partners for this program. Built Environment Plus, the International Living Future Institute and the Structural Engineering Institute have all been important collaborators in making this happen. And finally, I'd also like to recognize that this program series is supported by the Carbon Leadership Forum and its local knowledge community, CLF Boston which we invite you to join if you're interested. Um, and before we dive in, just a couple of notes. Uh, one learning unit is available for those who are eligible. We'll share the link to a Google form in the chat box. If you want continuing education credit, please add your name, email address, and AIA number there. If you're not an AIA, number, but AIA member, but you want a certificate, please enter your name and email address. And we are recording this session. It'll be posted to the BSA website, architects.org, later this week for you to access. Um, and please use the Q&A function to share any questions. We will address as many as we can. We're gonna be saving some time toward the end to take questions. So don't hesitate to put them in, but we will be holding most of them until the end. So unless there are some questions of clarification that feels important to uh, in intersperse, we will, um, we will hold them off until the moderated panel at the end. So you can see the agenda there. Um, this is about making the case generally. We're gonna go through four different firm approaches and then have some panel discussion and Q&A. So with that, here we are, let's dive in. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna just start by reminding uh, you all about something you already know. The sky is falling. Um, this situation has gotten out of control, it's serious and we need to do something about it. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so in case you haven't already seen this too many times, it feels like we used to show these slides a lot and then we've kind of stopped because we assume everybody's seen them. But every time I see them, it's like a, a renewed slap in the face. Um, but carbon dioxide levels have never been anywhere near, never in not just human history, but recent geologic history, been anywhere near uh, where they are now. And if you click again, you'll see the, um, we're talking about 1950 levels as kind of a baseline here, but even that was already quite high by historic proportions. And on the next slide, you'll see um, what's been happening with temperatures globally. And people often have complained about the fact that there's these anomalies and these differences between uh, different temperature measurements and trajectories, but this, this graph really illustrates 
how even when there are differences, the differences are kind of in the noise. They're not substantive. And um, if you click again, you'll see 1950 levels are right, um, right there where the, just before the temperatures started rising dramatically. So the link is pretty clear, the correlation between CO2 and temperature and a whole bunch of other challenges is pretty clear. Go on to the next slide. So we know that building materials are a huge part of the problem here. A lot of energy and carbon is emitted in the process of making them. But next slide, they're also part of the solution, right? And then next slide. So this is the challenge put to all of you, our esteemed panelists here. How do we get our clients and our colleagues and our collaborators to care and start to pay more attention to this? How do we make the case so I'm going to turn it over to you, Rachel, to kick off this conversation. Thank you, Nadav. It's great to be with you all this afternoon. Um, just to start off, give folks some sense of Big Meister. If you're not familiar with us, we are, as Nadav said, a residential design build remodeling firm. Um, the sweet spot of our work, the type of projects that we like to do combine improvements in livability and functionality with improvements in performance. So in comfort, efficiency, um, and reduced emissions. If you could go to the next slide. You'll see some examples of our recent projects um, to give you a sense of what we do. On the top um, left is a project that was a small second story addition uh, to create a master suite, some uh, fairly extensive interior um, reconfiguration, uh, external insulation changeover, whole house changeover from um, oil heat to mini splits um, and a heat pump water heater. And of course the seat, you see the solar panels. The top right um, is another example of a whole house conversion um, from oil and propane um, to electricity for heating, hot water, and cooking. And um, bottom right are two examples of some smaller scale um, partial renovation and retrofit projects. The bottom right is a basement finishing, uh, basement insulation and finishing for a um, um, hangout space and combined workout space and office, and then a, a roof, um, no foam roof retrofit um, on the bottom left. Most of our clients um, come to us asking um, for performance. Um, they come to us asking for efficiency, for reduced emissions. They're not all activists, but they're, um, they, they share that, that value and that goal. And so to some extent, it, um, I guess you could say, gives us a leg up in making the case for embodied carbon. Um, but it is a, a journey that we have only recently started on as we've begun thinking about the investments we're making in carbon upfront in order to save um, carbon down the road and whether or not those emissions um, make sense. And so now I'm going to turn to, next slide please, um, three strategies um, that um, we have been using, continue to use, um, and that I think really could be employed usefully for any um, sustainability initiative. Um, on, could be on healthy materials, on electrification, um, and, um, but in any event, these three strategies feel um, important to us. This first one um, may seem so obvious as to, um, that I don't even need to mention it, um, but it has um, come back to me over and again, the importance of this, of communicating your commitment um, and this is just an example of our website of one of those projects that I showed you um, where we took the house off of, off of oil and, and made it all electric. The focus on this project is on, um, which was a couple of years ago, was on operating emissions. We hadn't quite yet made the change to um, looking at or the transition to looking very closely at embodied emissions. But the, what I guess I want to point to here is about four or five years ago, we started making a really big push to helping our clients move off of fossil fuels and to electrifying our projects. And a key part of that was showcasing the projects that we had done successfully, blog posts, speaking. So there's this sort of virtuous circle that um, the more of electrification work that we did, the more of that type of work that we got, the more clients were coming to us asking for that. And so this is a strategy that we are starting to replicate um, in the push for embodied carbon. 
Second strategy, next slide, which is closely linked to the first, is to track and measure and share your impact. There's nothing that demonstrates commitment um, as effectively as tracking and measuring and reporting. Uh, this is a, um, a graph, or excuse me, a chart that I showed um, at the Building Energy Conference last week um, on a project that we recently completed um, where we calculated the embodied carbon of the envelope upgrades, uh, which included insulating the basement walls. Um, the above ground walls um, were uninsulated. We blew in cellulose as well as insulating um, the underside of the roof. And um, as we um, transition to looking at making carbon smarter choices, we need to um, calculate and evaluate those impacts um, and share how we're doing. And so that's, that's been, um, is, is critically important as well. And last but not least, is that it's really important to lead with carbon smarter options. So on this particular project, we had three approaches that we could have taken to insulating the attic or the roof line. This project included um, a whole house conversion to heat pumps. Um, the plan called for installing a ducted heat pump um, in the attic to serve uh, the second floor bedrooms. Um, the roof was not in scope, so external insulation was um, not something that we considered. So we had three approaches. The sort of business as usual standard approach would have been to do all closed cell spray foam at the underside of the roof. Another option, a carbon smarter option, um, would have been to or would be to insulate with three inches of closed cell spray foam to provide um, a vapor barrier, build down the rafters, and then fill those bays with cellulose. We call that the low foam or build down approach. And then the third approach um, is an approach that is appropriate um, if you don't need the attic for storage and you could just um, build a small head house to contain the mechanical equipment. When we presented to the client, we did not present the first option. Um, it's, we ended up presenting only the second two options. The client needed um, the attic space for storage and went with option, um, that second option. So in conclusion, just to sum up, um, my first takeaway is don't wait until you have the job or eat to make the case, or don't even wait till you're making the case for yourself to get the job to make the case. Start incorporating your commitment to um, carbon smart material choices in all of your messaging, your marketing, your talks, everything you do. And then hold yourself accountable to that. And that includes reporting impacts that you're not even so happy about, that aren't so great, where you wish you could have done better. And finally, set your standards and your goals. And if an option doesn't align with those, don't present it, or at least don't present it first. <laughs> and if you do present it, make it clear that it's out of alignment um, with where you're hoping to go. Great, thanks, Rachel. That was great. Um, Kate, are you ready to take it away? Yeah, I am. Excellent. So at Aero Street, our journey with um, embodied carbon started about two and a half years ago, and it started with one project where we were um, pursuing a lead credit, so we were starting to get in to understand what embodied carbon meant. Um, from there, over the last two years, um, we've made it standard practice on every large project, um, new construction as well as um, existing buildings where we might be doing ad reno, as well as also looking at our typical um, design decisions, things like exterior assemblies, walls, and roofs, um, making sure that we are taking in body carbon and really bringing it all the way through our practice. So what I'm gonna go over today is more our conversations that we have with clients, you know, that specific piece of how do we make the case when we're in front of a client. So I'm gonna just show you a few graphics that we use um, that we kind of, you know, present to the client, and again, a lot of our clients, next slide, have this idea of operational carbon um, or operational energy, and we're really kind of taking them through the journey of um, sort of thinking about um, carbon in a holistic manner. So everything from the embodied carbon through operational, we also talk about transportation carbon, everything that a particular building project um, can directly impact. And then, of course, we talk about, you know, how do you balance that emissions? How do you get to eventually net zero carbon? So next slide. When we're talking about operation, or sorry, embodied carbon, um, we really start at the beginning. Um, and this is kind of, I always link it to when we talk about operational carbon, we say the best thing that you can do is thinking about your siting, your orientation, 
um, your enclosure and your massing. And the same is really true for embodied carbon. Whatever you can do with optimization first before you get into, you know, products and content of products, that's really where you can make a huge impact. So um, optimizing the structure, I and mean, then that's things like, is your grid optimized? Are you doing the lightest structure that you can do? Are you doing a lot of jogs and in and out? So you're going to have, you know, a lot of excess steel or, or concrete in your building based on how you're doing um, your forms and optimization. So we kind of start there. And then we start thinking about materials, how to use less materials. And these, when we're talking to a client, um, we're really showing them how we're making a design that's going to be you know, efficient, ultimately going to cost less because of the systems um, and really the process that we're going through here. And, and whenever you can use less material and you have to buy less things, you're going to see um, savings there. So those are the types of things that we talk through um, when we're looking specifically embodied carbon. Then ultimately, and once we're getting into product selection, it's about how you choose those materials wisely um, that meet all of the other criteria of the project, but also have um, low carbon or no carbon. Um, and then ultimately, we also like to bring it back to we're going to get to a certain point, um, and how do we you know, get to you know, zero? And that starts to think about what can we do on site uh, for sequestration or vegetation, um, and then what might we have to do off site. So, next slide. And then some examples, you know, we're running, we use Tally as our analysis when we're doing life cycle assessments, um, but there's a lot of graphs and charts and numbers, and we try to keep it really simple when we're in front of the client talking to them, um, you know, taking that previous um, pathway and kind of making it into the project is where we're really um, making those choices. So. This is a particular client where we had a repeat client, so we could really compare what they have been doing in the past um, with us as well as other architects and where we were going to make some key decisions to you know, reduce embodied carbon. Um, and so we look at it from a whole building perspective. You go to the next slide. Um, we also look at it from, you know, element or components of a building. You know, this is particularly looking at cladding. Um, we usually redo graphs and you know, make it a little bit less about the um, specific numbers, but about comparing one thing to another, making sure we're bringing in all of the client's goals, that durability and, and um, lifetime um, use of the materials we might be studying. Okay, next slide. And so this is just looking at some more components. This particular project example is a um, parking garage, so it's a lot of concrete and steel. And so again, this is talking about different components where we change materials or we optimize um, the structure. If you go to the next slide. This is another project. Um, it was a new construction office building. So again, we started looking at it from a whole building perspective. Um, we were not only looking at optimizing the structure here, but we were looking at material of structure as well. So we looked at this being um, CLT wood structure versus what would we typically do in steel, um, and then it's gone to the CLT um, side of things. And then further optimization, we looked at, you know, cladding, um, we looked at the content of the um, cement replacement and the concrete, and then a lot of the things that we're doing as typical practice in our office um, embeds into this. So, you know, again, getting back to what Rachel was saying, um, you know, we don't offer materials in our exterior wall assemblies that we know are high carbon um, materials. That's just not something that we'll typically do. So we've already sort of optimized our, um, I guess you'd say, offerings or things that we'll present to the clients that we know will meet, you know, all the other budgetary durability you know, maintenance requirements as well as being low carbon. So there's things that we're doing on every project and we're walking the clients through, but we're also doing a lot internally in terms of our our internal practice and sort of setting our base standards. All right. Thank you, Kate. So you're seeing a progression here in terms of scale of project and, and focus. And Matt, if you're ready to take it away into the next, the next step. Yes, thanks very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Matt Gifford. I'm a principal at Shepley Bullfinch. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so we are a national firm with offices in Boston, Hartford, Houston, and Phoenix. And we work in three major um, sectors, kind of healthcare, education, and then some urban development projects largely around housing. 
Um, and so as we approach sustainability, sorry, not quite yet, as we approach sustainability across those sectors and across the country, you know, various um, portions of the country view these things differently, but then also within each market sector, they're viewed differently. So while we try to have a consistent approach to sustainability and carbon, we need to be really flexible with respect to where we are in the country and who we're working for specifically and in what market sectors. So now next slide, please. And so the way we like to ground this, and it's not always out loud, but at least to ourselves is that, you know, what are we trying to do? We're, you know, we're really trying to save the world and it can't be overstated the kind of the critical juncture that we're at now and probably have been working up to for the past 50 years or so. Um, so if you go to the next slide. And we're really involved in advocacy and that is not always what our clients hire us to do but it is what we think is really um, a critical aspect of our work and something that we want to embed in each of our projects. Next slide. So this is a, a slide from um, the first Earth Day in 1970. This work's been going on for a long time um, and we are part of that continuum today. So in the, and again, the next slide. You know, most recently Greta Thunberg's um, speech to the UN, which is an incredible speech to the UN that, um, made us all really stop and think and re-energize ourselves as to the commitment to, to this kind of work. Um, next slide. And then most recently with, with respect to the current times that we're in and how this relates to, to racial justice and, and equity, um, just again, increasing the importance of kind of how this work um, will, affect, will affect the world really. The next slide. And so where are we today? So um, again, here's a, a slide that's um, kind of projecting that we have just over a decade to get climate change under control before we really go beyond that 1.5 degrees Celsius, Celsius carbon budget that we have, and which is why embodied carbon has become so important. So next slide. You know, so previously, you know, in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years, I would say, of our uh, work on these types of issues, we focus a lot on operational carbon and how buildings operation. We got very good at doing energy models and reducing the amount of energy spent and, and moving into um, materials and the healthy health and wellness that materials bring can bring to a project. Um, but now we are at a critical juncture where we start to, uh, not quite yet, go back one, please. Um, really need to focus on the embodied carbon of our buildings because we need to do this in the next 10 years. And there's a, there's a better chance to do that with the embodied um, stuff than, than the operational stuff. And so with a main focus on a lot of these um, materials in terms of the ones that have used a lot of carbon, so the concrete and the steel and the aluminum. Uh, next slide now, please. And so we, we talk a lot about Reuse, reduce, reuse, and sequester. Reuse and reduce, we've been doing for a while, and sequester is kind of where we want to start to focus, where we have where we have started to focus our attention in order to be able to reduce the amount of embodied carbon in the projects that we're working on. Uh, next slide. And so again, I think like some others have talked about, started to target um, aspects of the materials in our building to really drive down the embedded uh, the embedded carbon in our projects and utilizing. Um, tally and other carbon counters to really try to understand how, as we're making decisions, how the, this relates to our projects. And we do this sometimes internally, sometimes, you know, in the face of the client, sometimes up front and sometimes on the back end, depending on who we're working for and how they proceed, you know, kind of where they start with for um, sustainability and carbon and what their understandings are um, with those processes. So we do the work anyway and how much we share depends on the client that we're working with and their um, aspirations and, and perspective on all of this stuff. That's great, thank you, Matt. Um, and Gunnar, over to you. Great, so hi, so I'm Gunnar Hubbard. I'm a principal at Fortin Tomasetti and I head our sustainability practice. We're a large engineering company with a reach across the globe. Um, and have uh, 10 practice areas, which really gives us sort of a, a neat range from uh, the technology of uh, specific parts of buildings, to obviously whole master plans and huge infrastructure impact. 
Next slide. Embodied carbon has been uh, something that we've been embracing since 2011. I think as an engineering company, we're one of the early ones to kind of look at what was going on with the 2030 initiative at the IA and realizing at that time we are, we are a company that's made up of a lot of structural engineers. That's really what the history of the firm is about. But we've diversified. But we made this course commitment to start reporting on our embodied carbon of our structures. And then from there, as the years progress here, we've been doing a lot of internal education, but then also starting to look at those opportunities to reach out and get involved in such organization as a carbon leadership forum, and then helping in the implementation, um, in creation and implementation of some of the tools to help the industry along. And so I'm gonna share a little bit about that. Next slide. So some of the reporting here on the left is just where we've been you know, calculating total numbers. You can see it's coming down and up as we've been getting better at calculating, but also on a yearly basis, sometimes it's more lab buildings or high rises. So that changes the, the, the numbers. And on the right side, looking at different market sectors where we're adding in different, different opportunities. Next slide. Um, so with our company being, you know, having so many um, structural uh, opportunities, uh, when you add up the impact of embodied carbon on buildings, it really comes around to, to, to you know, we have the ability to swing the needle. And I think that's why it's been embraced so, um, um, uh, so much within the company um, and in the work that we're doing and we're trying to get better at. It. So next slide. Um, so it's it's really coming around to how do you take all this data, right? How do you put that at the fingertips of designers and get at that conversations that happen early enough and all the different facets that this whole series has been trying to train um, uh, these architectural professionals about. So it's how do you pull that together and make sure it's into a, a conclusive uh, data or inclusive and, and how do you um, carry that forward? So we've been doing a bit with um, collaborating with MIT in terms of a database. We've been giving the information to the Carbon Leadership Forum and it's really been helping, we feel the industry, but then ourselves, the next slide, is um, getting us the ability as we're evaluating different structural systems and when we're working with architects to sort of ask those some key questions as different um, forms are coming to together and to respond to the client needs, how does that translate? What's the best solution? And how, how can we give that data um, at an earliest stage as possible uh, to help inform decision making and really sort of change changes uh, really the culture of design and the importance as we all know about embodied carbon. So we have come up with some tools. Next slide. Uh, so this one's called Spotlight, which um, uh, looks like it's in the animation's not working, but that's all right. Um, it's basically one that was trying to um, actively go through and look as you, you click on different parts of the building. So this is taking you know, a very complex model and breaking it down by parts of it. And you can start rotating the dials around to sort of see where your biggest impacts are as you look at different opportunities. And what we realized that this is a tool we were building internally that the uh, that parts of this could be easily put out as an open source item. And so that's kind of how we, we decided to go forward. So the next slide um, is a tool that's called Beacon. And this is um, an open source Revit plugin that we've made that's free. Um, and it, it, it allows you again to sort of quickly get those calculations because the data is everything, right? To help us understand. And once this gets exported from your Revit file, you get to quickly see where those quantities are and then you can start dialing it in. And it links up in the upper right, you see that red um, and the green and the yellow sort of tells you where you're standing relative to some of the other metrics out there in the industry. So it's a good sort of helpful supportive tool. Um, so we're pleased to do that. And that's how we're trying to help make the case how important this is by also taking some of our research and technology and supporting the industry. Next slide. So then the strategies then are, you know, how you optimize your project, um, obviously balancing between new and retrofit um, and look for those, you know, what you can do for just making the right sizing the building overall, as others have already said, right? Uh, laying out those rules of thumb and then kind of go through strategies to, to optimize the systems and use those, the, the data as tools to help you understand the impact that your design is having and communicate that to the client so they know why one scheme may have a better 
a solution than another from an embodied carbon perspective. And then ultimately, once the design goes forward, how do you get that transparency out? How do you disclose and help the industry advance and learn from it? And that's something that at Thornton Thomas Study we're completely committed to and participating in in a good way. So next slide. So there's a lot of work to be done. I won't read through all of these, but I think that's what's exciting about this whole forum um, and this whole series because it's sort of bringing through all those questions and realizing that we do have a lot to offer as an AC industry to, to the world to make a difference. I think that's why we're all here and participating. So we have uh, a big job to do and I like this uh, the way in the next slide, they, um, architect magazine sort of put this article out you know it's time to quit um, getting those emissions into the air and and I think the more that we can embrace the thinking about embodied carbon as much as many of us have embraced the operational side so well over the years bringing those together with the importance as Matt said you know as pointed out in the next 10 years so with that thank you very much super thank you Gunnar thanks to all of you for those great introductory presentations and, and also for keeping them quick and tight because it gives us plenty of time to dive in now and really um, talk to some of these questions. There's a few questions starting to come in on the Q&A. We encourage you to um, keep sending those. And um, we're gonna start in with um, kind of asking you to come back to when it's not easy, when you get pushback, especially from clients, you know, what is the pushback and how have you, how do you respond to it or how have you dealt with that? So, um, I don't know, Rachel, do you want to start in on that? Is there any, do you have any thoughts on that? And um, we can go around and see, you don't, you know, I'll have to respond on all of it, but let me know, I'll, I'll go around unless you tell me not to. Um, so, you know, the, um, the first uh, challenge that that comes to mind um, this sort of a, a, a long standing one you know in, in our practice or that comes up over you know we mostly are working on existing buildings so we 're already re, you know doing building reuse right but we it 's the it 's the question of of additions and whether we can meet a client 's goals and their programming needs you know within the footprint right or whether and you know so this is a variation on a theme of how do you how do you optimize how do you do how do you do less and um, you know our approach there um, and when we face other pushback is to you know we start with this is how we do things we we start by looking for solutions within the existing footprint um, and then if we if we can't find a solution then then we'll go from there um, the other sort of challenge we come up against is where we, we really, the only option that we have is a, is a higher carbon, higher carbon option. You know, I, the examples that I, material option, the examples that I gave, you know, that I showed of where we could optimize material choices is sort of easy. Um, there, there are times where it's not easy, um, you know, and so, um, so some of some of the times you you win the battle, I guess, and sometimes sometimes you don't. You make compromises. I think the the important thing is to be having those conversations um, from the outset. Great. Yeah, Kate, do you have any thoughts on on this? I would say uh, two things. Um, one, I would kind of plays off what, what, what Rachel was saying was that. A lot of times we have clients when we're talking about existing buildings and they have a program, they have a building, um, they may have already purchased the building or maybe there's a couple of sites that they're looking at. A lot of times we try to, you know, that, do that um, square peg in a round hole. Like we're trying to figure out how can we, and you know, we look at those buildings and maybe they don't work, um, right? We have to do so much to save the structure, so much to save the facade that in the end, um, it doesn't make sense to reuse those buildings. So. And we're not there yet, but what we're trying to do is figure out how we can work more with clients to select buildings that really might lend themselves to their program. So that's where use can be great for certain things, but it's not for others. And so if we can try to make better connections with clients and with, um, real estate professionals to try to find the right buildings that would work for a school or a lab or whatever the program is, um, as opposed to just working with what you're given and it doesn't always work out. And then the other thing is that, um, you know, sometimes clients just really 
want some specific material. They're attached to it for a very you know, wide variety of reasons. They like the aesthetic, um, they've used it a million times. Um, and so it's about working through, you know, how do you, how can, if it's aesthetics, then maybe you're never going to get over that. Um, you can, you can offer them a lot of things, but if it's, if it's driven by the way something looks, we can't always go get what we want in terms of low carbon, but for pretty much anything else, we can look at it, look at cost, durability, and maintenance, replacement, all of those things, and we can usually find a low carbon solution that meets all those, those all of those criteria. Um, so those are really the two pieces where we find our, where we're trying to just, you know, make things work um, that are really important to focus on. Super, yeah. Um, Matt, do you have any thoughts on this? Or what happens when you get challenged? Yeah, I mean, I think the way, you know, we start to try to have a conversation with framing goals and aspirations for the project. And so we try to build in um, kind of align the goals for the project with the with the values of the institution so that we kind of have um, priorities set and goals agreed to up front. And so then when decisions get, then when you get down the road and you're evaluating different systems, you can try to tie them to the values and the goals of the institution. So if we can get them to buy into really driving down the embodied carbon, we can start to talk about why it's important to spend, you know, prioritize those aspects of the decisions that we're making over others. Great. Yeah. And Gunnar. Yeah, I think it's sort of builds on what Matt was saying, you know, how do you put the information forward for decision making? And I think, you know, as an industry, we are so used to showing return on investment. That's what clients want to know about. Like, so that challenge of, of how, how do you show the return investment of reduction in embodied carbon? It's, it's, it's a, it's a different, sort of different conversation, different dialogue than we've been able to have when we're talking about overall operational energy and, and that side. So it's, it's, it's just that SWIFT uh, it's, is obviously equal as equally and if not even more important to be bringing that into the conversation. But it's, a, it's, a, it's like you're, you're driving towards a different value set within your clients um, is what it gets down to. And, and, and then it takes a design team to then come up with a solution that, that really does work um, for the project at hand and problem at hand without, without, um, without yeah, so coming up with a reduction of body carbon and still meeting all the program requirements and aesthetic requirements that we all right. need, need to deliver, yeah. Great, and so staying with you, Gunnar, for a minute, um, the, the structural engineers in your firm, um, or maybe more importantly for firms that are not already as far along as you guys are, how should an architect or a client approach their engineer in terms of both um, expressing interest and sort of asking them to do the right thing, but also um, sort of assessing whether or not they're working with the right structural engineers who really get it in terms of the opportunities here. Yeah, well, I think I think it's the, the, the initial conversation that has to be had before the pen hits the paper, even before the firm gets hired as part of that interview process, and, you know, to explain what is, you know, in this case, we're, you know, making the business case, right? What is your company commitment to embodied carbon and getting that clarity? Because if it's, if there's a hesitation right from the beginning that the company is not already on this and taking action and embracing how important this is, then that's probably the wrong firm right from the beginning. Now, right. because, structural uh, engineers should be, they should be out front on this, right? They should be, and and the reality is that a big firm like ours, quite honestly, not every single one of our engineers is there right yet. So there's a bit of patience. Um, so sometimes you got to look holistically. But I think it's then just asking those specific questions of if we want to do a, a project that is going to be, um, you know, low embodied carbon. You know, what are some of those initial thinkings and and you know challenge the structural engineer right from the beginning again, yeah. before the pen hits the paper is is what I put out there. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, so there's a question in the Q&A, Matt. Um, I think you were the one who had a slide with some of specific material examples, including a carbon positive aggregate. Can you say any more about that product is the question? Yeah, that I, don't is? Know that. I think we're exploring, I mean, you know, as we go farther down this road, I think we're exploring various options. And yeah. I don't know, you know, frankly, I don't know too much about carbon positive aggregate, but it is something that we push on when, as we're kind of digging into the concrete and making more, um, yeah kind of more sustainable concrete. Does anyone else know about the, I think it's Blue Planet is the company that's been promoting carbon positive, right, aggregate made with uh, coal power plant emissions. 
none of us can say more on that. All right, we'll uh, research sorry. that and get back to you. Um, check out Blue Planet, uh, whoever asked that question, if you want to find out more Blue Planet. Um, I think they're the company who's, who's developed that. Um, so, um, Kate, maybe you can start in on this first and then see if others want to join in. But uh, there's a question about interior product, sort of projects or products for interior mm -hmm. interiors. And um, the fact that, you know, while they're not often focused on initially because they're not structure and shell, there's often a lot of turnover and churn there that can add up over time. So what yeah. are the opportunities um, there and how are you how are you approaching that? Yeah, I think that's a, a big concern. You know, we do have um, a decent amount of interior work and what we've been really focusing on is, you know, what can we do, right? Like, so we can't guarantee that a tenant's not going to move every five years and then the next tenant coming in isn't going to want to demo the whole thing. So we have to look at what can we do for this space that we're doing. So um, selecting products that are, you know, salvaged products. Um, Recently, somebody put out a call to a huge group of architects in Boston and said, I have worked at a project and they're going to demo this, you know, large amount of wood in this project. I want more emails like that. And so I've been thinking, how can I do that? Well, we have projects, you know, and I think just that like really sort of grassroots um, effort by people to say like, I have a project and we're going in, my client doesn't want something, but it's been demoed and somebody else might want it. And, you know, it's, it's a substantial thing. So um, we've been always looking for salvage and re um, reusable products. And so the more solutions we have or more sources for those, I think that would be great. Um, I think as we you know, develop the circular economy a little bit more, we'll start to have those, um, you know, things that we can do. Um, and then again, it's getting back to not putting in as much material. So sometimes if you think about an interior space, you might have like six different layers of, you know, finishes on a wall. Um, and then, you know, all the support systems and structurals and clips. And like, if you actually start to look at what we're doing in the interiors, um, you can really simplify it. And um, at first clients get a little bit worried. They're like, oh, is this like just going to look really raw and plain or, and it's not about that. You know, you can have lots of um, very different um, looks to a space, but it's about really thinking about, do you need seven layers on this wall? How can you simplify it? Um, and where can you use materials in the right way? Um, so it's really about salvaging and then reducing the amount of materials that we have. Um, and then hopefully we can also select materials that can be recycled or have a take back program so that hopefully that happens if someone comes in and demos the space after our client. That's great. I can imagine, especially on smaller interiors project, you have the option sometimes to design around what's available as opposed to with, with salvage. Often the problem is you can't, you can't order it off the shelf, right, to meet your specs. So you, you kind of have to be flexible in terms of designing with, with what's there. Great. Um, so, and um, I think this is primarily, again, Kate and, and Matt, for you guys, this question of, um, so it's one thing to consider this on an individual project by project basis, but how do you look at carbon reduction goals for across all projects? Or, you know, is this something that can be set as a target for firm wide? Um, Kate, why don't you start there and then we'll see if Matt or others want to want to jump in on this. Do you, do you have a, an approach to trying to address this as a, as a firm wide goal and not just on those few uh, projects that are asking for it? Yeah, I think um, it's two things. One is that once you learn on one project, um, you can hopefully then have that be a baseline for the next project and for all of your projects. So concrete has been a you know an interesting experience for us of getting a project through in documentation and through bidding to see you know what are really the challenges there with specifying and working with um you know the ready mix suppliers and things like that so that's been a learn and then propagate across projects um so that's one example and then the other um as i mentioned earlier is just looking at the way we were doing typical things so way that we typically develop um, exterior walls or roof assemblies, um, if we can make some choices by understanding how we are performing in terms of body carbon with what we've always been doing, and then if we can make some small tweaks there, and then that is a simple thing to roll out, um, you know, across our projects. So some of it's learning and some of it's, you know, making some systemic change that you know you'll be doing the right thing on every project. Super. And I just... Uh, I would just before you go, Matt, somebody sure. uh, on the Q&A, Laurel is shouting out about that. Thanks, thanking you for the shout out about the salvage wood opportunity. 
and mentioning the deadline is this Wednesday. So on that if you're looking at that. All right. Matt, go ahead. I was just going to add to what to what Kate said about uh, about tracking this and benchmarking it is that you know the the carbon counters that we have now and um, tally is just kind of relatively new. You know we're about ten years behind where we are or fifteen years behind where we are with energy modeling, and it's kind of the same thing in terms of how we build it into our process, how we build it into our design process, so that we can understand what those benchmarks are and then be able to set goals to make it better to do it better on the next project. So I still. So we're still very much in the learning process about what those benchmarks are. We're trying to improve where we can. We're trying to improve the specs where we can, um, and then trying to you know kind of develop a history of where our projects are, so that we can then set goals more uh, specifically. Great. Okay, and I know it's tempting to get into a lot of the sort of how to how to do this and and how do you deal with this in the, in the specifics and. Um, I maybe haven't been good enough so far about filtering this, but trying to bring us back to this making the case conversation, because there have already been 10 sessions on uh, all, many different aspects of how to do this on projects. Um, so sorry for some of you who are posting questions about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to keep us more focused on, on the making the case question. And there's an interesting one here um, in the Q&A, which is kind of about the ethics of this. And when there's a tension between your obligations to the client versus your commitment to the planet. Um, and so the question specifically as phrased is, um, what if you're choosing not to show a, an option because it's high carbon, um, but that would be the lowest cost option for the client? Are you being fair to them? How do you, Rachel, do you wanna to talk to that? How do you, how do you balance those, commit, those potential conflicts? Um, that's a really great, great question. Great question. I'm not sure I have a satisfactory answer except to say that it's something that um, I guess we do um, we do quite regularly. We um, we don't um, ever put forward installing fossil fuel um, systems in buildings um, anymore as our first choice. Um, we tell people that we um, we start with induction. We tell them to go look at induction. Um, we, you know, with the project, I, the example I gave, you know, where we didn't present the, the foam roof, that was a little bit, all foam roof, that would have been a little bit cheaper, maybe three or $4,000 cheaper. Um, but we didn't present that. I mean, I think we would have presented it if we had gotten pushback on the, on the cost of that. But I think, you know, I was struck, as I, thinking about this, I re returned to what Matt said about goals. Um, and the client's goals for the project and their goals, you know, in our case, goals for their home. And we're establishing, um, one of the things that makes this easier for us is that most of our clients either come to us asking to, they want to do the right thing for the planet. And if they, you know, aren't asking for that, they're not at, you know, activists from the get-go, get we're sort of bringing that to the table and making that part of the conversation. So it feels, um, I don't know, maybe I'm shirking the question, but it doesn't feel unethical to me in light of the overall um, goals for all of our projects to be operating this way. Um, so if they've so, come to you, they know what they're getting into. Is that I, <laughs> thank you, Nadav. <laughs> That's exactly what I mean. <laughs> all right, Gunnar, do you have a, a response on that? Yeah, no, I think, I think to that last point, right, the, the client should be coming to you, to a team, to a firm because the, they're doing the right thing they're setting the right tone the right attitude like that's that's so important so um just for disclosing that and saying that we are going to provide you the, the what we think is you know an options for the best solutions there it's in and if it's not the cheapest you're sort of laying out the reasons why and you're making the case you're doing the numbers you're showing the data of why a particular solution while it may cost a little bit more here are the impacts that roll roll through through the decision making process. And I think that comes along with honesty and integrity. And you know, that's what I, I would think and hope that clients are looking for. And again, if they've come to you in the first place and you're trying to show that you're making a difference, um, it's, it's an opportunity to educate. And, and I, I, I think it's the right thing, so. So you're, but it sounds like you're also arguing for some transparency there, like making sure the client is aware that there might be a lower cost option, but this is why you think it's not the best option for them. Yeah, that some other engineers might approach it X, Y, and Z way, but this is why we think it is. And, and you say, yeah. we will explore these other options if you feel strongly, you know, or, you know, you could sort of present it that there's some others there, but we think these are the best for these reasons. Yeah. 
Yeah, Matt, do you have any thoughts on this? I was just going to add that um, there may be some opportunities, maybe particularly on, you know, we work on some larger projects to be able to, I would agree with Gunnar about being transparent up front, but saying, trying to save the money elsewhere. So yeah, this is going to cost you more. It's more directly related to the goals or the priorities for the project, or it's going to benefit the project in this certain way. We're going to try to make up that money somewhere else, you know, kind of look at the project as a whole and kind of really prioritize where you want to spend the money. And if this is where, you know, and the goals are aligned, then that should be an argument that can be made. Not so working time, within the clients, as long as you're within the client's budget, you're talking about where to, how to allocate the, the available funds as opposed to. Exactly. Yeah, cool. Kate, do you have any thoughts on this? No, I would just second what Gunnar said that, um, you know, again, they're coming to you. They know what your values are. We're very clear about what our mission, mission as a firm is and what our ethical commitments are. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, if that's what you're basing your decisions on, I think your client's going to be aware of that. Great. And um, there's a question here that I think is a bit of a suggestion built into it as well around um, using owner's project requirements. And so do any of you have experience with trying to get this kind of thing into the, you know, working with the owner to get this kind of clear, clarified as a goal within the owner's project requirements or, or your response to it? And then, um, you know, is that is the conversation different when you've done that than when it's not there and you're bringing it in maybe later to the conversation? I'm going to leave that open for whoever wants to jump in on that one. Yeah, I, yeah, I was. Go sorry, ahead, Matt. Go ahead, no, you go. You go. <laughs> I would say absolutely. I would say absolutely. The you know that's what I was talking about. If you can, if you can uh, kind of get alignment on what the goals and priorities are for the project long before you're creating the the project requirements and built into the specifications, then yes, you can write it in right into there, and it's very helpful in kind of making the case to the contractor and maintaining the consistency across the project to really be able to achieve those goals. Obviously, if you know if you state all of these goals up front and you build them into the design, but you actually can't construct it or you can't get it finalized and built and bought out the way that you anticipated going, then you really haven't done much good at all. So yeah, we try to do that a lot. Yeah, Gunnar, go ahead. Yeah, I think just by having it in the owner's project requirements, right, the OPR, you're you're getting that buy-in because our, we serve our clients. So if the client understands what they're asking for and challenging the design team to come together and the contractor to meet certain requirements, like, you know, 20% reduction in embodied carbon on the structure and facade, like that's some language that we're seeing showing up more and more. And it's, you know, building from ILFIs, one of their, you know, requirements. And can we go further? Absolutely. And it sort of also starts depending on the type of building um, that you have and some of the spans that you're trying to make starts dictating what are some of the solutions you might arrive at based on that OPR, right? So wood can only span so far, for example, and we all love it and want to bring it into more and more projects, mass timber, but sometimes it just can't do the job. So how do you, how do you, how do you get to the answer in different ways? Great. Anyone else on that or, or how often is, is this starting to happen that that's part of your the OPR from the client or the, is that happening more and more for, for any of you? We're, well, I mean, we're pushing it. So yeah, <laughs> we're, we're seeing it happen more and more because of it. Yeah. Yep. Great. Um, so I'm sort of filtering through the questions here and trying again to focus on the ones that are that are about making the case. Uh, Lisa Carey Moore is um, mentioning that Urban Land Institute has a document about making the business case for why real estate should pay pay attention to embodied carbon. So if it's not already been shared as part of the series, I'm sure we can get get that posted. Um, and um, so. What about working with product manufacturers? Have any of you tried to work with the product manufacturers themselves, understanding that there's a long product development cycle and it's not necessarily quick to change how things are made, but sometimes you've got you've to work uh, with them, right? I would say on, that we've worked with product manufacturers yeah. on, I think I'm frozen. No, we're hearing you though. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. I would say we've worked a lot with product manufacturers on um, healthy materials aspects. So, at, uh, you know, on one of our major projects, we've gone um, and done some actually with Gunnar and, and some of that work of to try to get to the manufacturers early and get them to declare their labels, what's in there and those kind of things. And then tried to use those 
use those tools to move the market to get manufacturers to change their products by saying, you know, we're not going to buy these things. We're not going to specify these things if we can't do this, if you don't declare what's in your projects. I don't think that we've gotten to the point where we have done that on the carbon front yet, but I can mm -hmm. see that that's a way to go. And I don't necessarily think that it would maybe impact the specific project you're working on, but it might be the next one. And it might be the next one. It's a little bit of um, looking forward to be able to change the industry kind of over time. Great. Yeah, I think working, you know, when you have the opportunity to work with institutions that have multiple building projects going on where you can sort of set that stage and um, is where you can have the biggest um, impact on getting manufacturers to buy in and say, oh, that's, they're changing their approach, their space spec. Oh, if we, we want to be part of that. So, you know, those, that's where the opportunity lies. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I do want to mention there's some other questions showing up about where does it you find resources on relative embodied carbon or what kind of language do you add to the spec? I would refer people to some of the earlier uh, programs in this series. They're, they're all posted online. There are, there are whole sessions on the tools and resources for, for tracking and finding products and, and I think a session on, on spec language. Um, and so there's a question here that is also, I mean, it's, it's sort of process, but I think it's tied to making the case. Have any of you been able to charge for additional services just for tracking embodied carbon? This is something, is the client willing to, to foot the bill for some of the soft costs on this? Or is it all stuff you guys have done uh, kind of as part of your process, built it into your fee somehow, or, or as, a, as a way to uh, win the work? I, I can jump in on this from a consultancy, sustainable consultancy side um, on some of the projects pursuing lead certification that you know, some of the, the lead credits that ask for this documentation to get the credit, we're getting some additional services because on some large scale projects, it's a big effort. And if we're not the structural engineer too, it's that effort of trying to bridge the gap and pull that data together. So we've, we've been able to get additional services for that, yep. Great. So that's, as a sustainability consultant, you've been able to do that. What about any of you as architects or design build? I would just say that we um, we have not um, charged for for this, um, and we've been um, tracking and reporting on operating impacts, you know, for for a long time. And that feels like I'm not even sure um, that we would want to try to charge for it. Um, it's you know something we want to build into our practice and how we do things. It's not um, something that's sort of optional. Um, mm -hmm. Great. Kate or Matt, anything quickly you want to add on that? Um, really, it's, it's baked into our fees. There might be some times where, as Gunnar said, if it's part of lead, um, and we're doing you know, excessive calculations, um, or if we were doing excessive runs of structural models, um, there might be additional fees, but it generally is um, part of our textual services. Yeah, Matt's nodding. Great. Well, that brings us to the end of our time. So thank you all. This was really great, great conversation. Thank you to Kate, Matt, Gunnar, and Rachel. And thanks again to our sponsors uh, for making this possible and our partners. And um, there is a link now in the uh, chat for the continuing education. So if you wanna get that credit, don't forget to go in there and enter your, your name and number. And um, also don't forget that there is one more session yet to come in this series. So next up, we're gonna close out with a session on process and firm culture. So some of the questions that we were starting to get into here and people were asking here are certainly gonna be appropriate there. So how to integrate carbon thoughtful design into your, into your, um, your own practice and your firm's practice. So that's, uh, that's next week. Hope you can join for that last session in the series. And I personally wanna thank VSA and all the sponsors and partners for putting this on because I think this is it's awesome that that you're doing this and thanks again to all of you um, for speaking today. It was great, great material. Great to uh, great to see all of you and to hear from you on your experiences with this. So thank you very much. Great, thanks, thank everyone, you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.